Good evening, Fountain of Life. We're so glad that you're joining us. Those of you who are our friends and are watching us online today, we want to welcome you to this Facebook Live Bible study that we do every Wednesday night. And uh, so uh, we're grateful for your presence today. And uh, I want to encourage you to share this out on social media. Just hit that share button if you could. And uh, that would be a blessing uh, to us and perhaps to others. Uh, tonight we've got a great a Bible study prepared for you. It's on how to battle your flesh. We started a new series of Bible studies last week when we introduced the subject of the three different battlegrounds, the three different battle fronts, and we're going to continue that tonight. And so we hope you have a pen and paper, or uh, perhaps you've been on our website, folcc.org, and uh, you've been able to download or look at the, the notes for this uh, Bible study. If you look under Pastor Bob's blog, you will find uh, underneath that first article every Monday or Tuesday that's going to be posted, uh, you'll find the notes within that article so that you can just follow along with us today uh, because, uh, you know, that's that's also very important. Many people learn visually and by studying. But anyway, we're grateful that you're with us. Can we just join in a moment of prayer, moment of prayer today? Heavenly Father, let your anointing of your Holy Spirit just abide with us today as we study your word and look deeply into it. And Lord, I pray that this study, Lord, is in particular, Lord, that deals with the inner workings of our heart and mind and our flesh. Lord, I pray that it would be real and powerful to us and that we might grow in you today. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, I know that it's the late August and not the 4th of July, but uh, some of my illustrations today kind of are from, you know, the American Revolution, and uh, they fit so well into this teaching that I just had to use them. Uh, but anyway, 244 years ago on July the 4th, 1776, uh, we can say that heroes of the American Revolution signed the Declaration of Independence, of Independence and this country then became a nation, right? Uh, but I want you to see something in that little simple history lesson. First, they declared themselves free, and then they fought the battle. Now, as we learn how to battle our flesh, this is an important principle because the same thing happens with us. God declares us to be free, we believe it, and then we fight that battle for freedom. Now, I, for one, am proud to be American, even uh, with all the things that are going on in our country. I'm still proud of this country. And uh, when I was just a young boy, I, I read a book about a man by the name of John Paul Jones. He was one of my favorite heroes of the American Revolution. And uh, he was a Scottish board captain, uh, one of the most able commanders in the American fleet. And he became my hero because he fought against some really impossible odds, and he won. Even when his ship, the Von Hame Richard, was very badly damaged, he was surrounded by two British warships, he refused to give up. I mean, things were going so bad for him that everyone expected for him to, to, to surrender. I mean, his ship was on fire, uh, his ship was sinking, and in those days, courtesies were extended, right, to people of rank. And so the captain of the English ship offered John Paul Jones, uh, you know, uh, a residence, a safe harbor for him. If he would just surrender, that nothing would uh, be negative would befall him. Now, understand that he could have saved himself had he just surrendered but and he was literally in danger of losing his life his ship was sinking his men were dying he was under attack by two ships and yet he cried out some words that have become very famous and i love these words this is what he said he said i have not yet begun to fight and so with renewed vigor from a sinking ship, he wound up sinking one of the enemy's ships and then managed to somehow board and overthrow the other English ship, capturing it for a tremendous victory. And as a boy, you know, I, I read a book about that and, uh, and it was powerful in my life and I remember that. But uh, I want you to understand something today. I'm not just telling you this for no reason. Uh, the, there was uh, battles that were going on, okay? First of all, there was the external battle that was going on in the physical sense, right? 
you know, muskets and, and cannonballs flying and all of that. Uh, but there was also another battle that was being fought on the inside of John Paul Jones. Uh, you know, as evidenced by his actions, he must have been willing to die in order to win the victory. But I know that inside of his deepest part of him that day, uh, that there was at least a small part of John Paul Jones that we could call his flesh that did not want to surrender. Nobody's flesh wants to die, right? His flesh probably wanted to accept those nice little terms, uh, you know, offered by the English. But, uh, you know, he managed to put his flesh aside, and we don't know what motivated him to do that. It might have been, you know, glory or anger or pride. We don't know. But there were two battlefronts that day, right? One inside of John Paul Jones and the other on the physical battle that was taking place on the outside. Now, that battle, that, that's true of, of, of warfare in, uh, in many cases. I think of the men at Valley Forge, right? Another American revolutionary story, right? They were shivering in the snow. They didn't have the proper provisions of food or even, or even shoes. And so daily the question had to arise in their minds as, you know, should I go? Do, do I defect? Will we win or will, will I die? Their flesh was crying out to be saved. But we know that uh, they pressed on to win the victory and, and uh, you know, we gained our independence. But anyway, you might be thinking, what is all this, you know, American flag waving, good stories? What's that have to do with me, okay? And the message and the series that we're in. Uh, first of all, I want to remind you that you're in a battle. The flesh versus the spirit, okay? Uh, I don't care who you are, how long you've been a Christian, you know, if you have a position in the church, you know, the struggle against sin is a battle that we all fight. And many times that we think that battle's all external as we walk through the world, you know, and, and uh, you know, we're going across the television channels or out there in the world, you know, we, you know, we see the allures of the enemy trying to get us uh, to go. And, and many people feel like their struggle with the sin for, with sin and the battle for holiness is on the outside. It's all out there in the world. But let me assure you today that the biggest battle and I believe even the first battle that you've got to win is the battle on the inside to master oneself. And that's the struggle that the Bible calls the battle between the flesh and the spirit. And that's why Jesus, when he gave the call to discipleship, you're probably wondering when we're going to get to the word. Here it is, Matthew 16, 24. He said these words, Matthew 16, 24. Then said Jesus unto his disciples, if any man will come after me, notice what it says, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. It's that denying of oneself, the denying of your flesh that is hard. It's a struggle on the inside of us. You see, the truth is there's a part of us that's inclined toward evil. We want the pleasure of, of that sin for a moment. And and, and uh, your spirit that's been born again, right, uh, that good part of you, that, that that's struggling against the flesh. And the spirit of God is also struggling against the flesh. And so there's this battle that goes on. Galatians talks about it. Paul does. Galatians 5, 17 says this, for the sinful nature, now that's where the NIV translates it, but the King James Version in the Greek word is the word flesh. It says, for the sinful nature or the flesh desires what is contrary to the spirit and the spirit what is contrary to the flesh or the sinful nature. They're in conflict with each other so that you do not do what you want. So we've got to recognize where the battle lies, all right? The battlefront. And the battle is between the flesh and the Holy Spirit. And so this is what I believe today. And the Bible teaches that through the power of the Holy Spirit in our lives, we can have victory on the inside. Now, let me just tell you, if you're going to fight against sin in your own power, you are not going to make it. You don't have a chance in this fight. But I believe with the help of the Spirit of God, 
we can uh, have freedom, we can master our flesh, and we'll know what it is like to have that freedom that comes on the inside. And it makes all the difference in the world if you have the one self-mastery over the flesh as you're in the battles. We're going to look at in the next couple of weeks the battle with the world and with the devil. So let me just say that the biggest struggle of your life is against sin, and it takes place on the inside. And I want you to remind you that that Satan, man, he's playing for keeps in this day and age. He always has. Sin has consequences. The Bible says that the wages of sin is death. If you allow your flesh to rule you, you will reap corruption. I'm just going to read the scripture for you today. Galatians 6 and verse 8 from the New King James Version says this, For he who sows to the flesh will of the flesh reap corruption, but he who sows to the Spirit will of the Spirit reap everlasting life. And so sowing to the flesh is giving in and giving the flesh what it wants. Sowing to the Spirit is giving in and doing what the Spirit of God wants for us to do. And so the question is, where are you sowing this morning? Are you sowing to the flesh or to the Spirit? Remembering that sin brings death. It destroys. It kills. It kills marriages and homes and relationships. Sin can cause you to lose your job. You know, certain sins, you know, uh, even have an effect on the physical body. You know, I know people who have literally drank themselves to death. And, and But the good news today is this, all right? That Jesus came. He not only promised us forgiveness of sins. Oh, I'm so grateful that my sins are forgiven, aren't you? But he also promised us freedom from sin. And so tonight I want to give you some very practical help. How do you battle against your own flesh? We have going to, I'm going to give you something that if you uh, uh, understand it and apply it, it could literally change your life. And uh, how we live really matters to God. And so I'm going to give you tonight four strategies, if I can get through them all, we'll see. Four strategies for defeating the flesh, all right? First of all, number one, accept who you are in Jesus by identifying with Christ. Accept who you are in Jesus by identifying with Christ. Uh, in, in a very real sense, I'm going to go back to my first illustrations of the American Revolution. They accepted their new identity when they declared themselves to be free from the British. And the Bible tells us that we are to accept our new identity by counting ourselves dead to sin and alive to God. And there's great power in this because there's power in what you believe about yourself and God knows this and uh, now this might get kind of a little complicated I hope not uh, but, but earlier in my life I read some of these things I didn't really understand them I've studied uh, uh, this I, I think I've got a grasp on it and so I'm giving you meat of the word tonight but I've kind of tenderized it a little bit but I want you to understand it and this is an extremely important concept for you to grasp okay what you believe about yourself is going to affect the way you think, the way you act, and ultimately the character that you have. So let's put this in terms that we can understand. I, I love this illustration, all right? The Civil War, war was uh, fought, and God, I believe, helped the right side to win. And uh, now we have to understand that the South was completely filled with slaves. Some of these slaves were third and fourth generation slaves. All they knew was slavery. All they knew was being beaten and oppressed. Uh, they were not only physically abused, but verbally abused in a sense that they were brainwashed. And all they understood about life was that the whites had guns and whips, and, and because of the horrible oppression, they had learned how to live and to survive as a slave. Now, follow me today, all right? Abraham Lincoln comes along. He signs the Emancipation Proclamation. The Civil War uh, comes to an end. The South is defeated, 
And uh, we know that just some of the slaves heard that they were free, right? It took two years for, you know, that news to spread for obvious reasons. But, uh, but uh, they finally heard, you know, you're free. And in a very real sense, they were free. And the idea should have been, now track with me, that every single slave in the South could have just, you know, gathered their meager belongings and moved to Colorado or California and just started over. Did they do it? No, of course not. Why? Here's the reason why. Now follow with me. It's because they didn't understand how to accept and to apply their new identity. Were they free? Yes. Did they act free? You know, a couple did. Some did. The great majority did not. Here's why. They needed to be taught how to live as free men and women. You say, well, what does all that have to do with me, man? I'm not a slave. I'm not a slave owner. So uh, here's what the Bible tells us. The Bible tells us that sin enslaves us. If you don't believe it enslaves you, just try on your own. Uh, to overcome some sinful thought or habit. It's very difficult. It will enslave you. Romans 6 verse 16 tells us this. It's the Bible. Don't you know that when you offer yourselves to someone to obey him as slaves, you are slaves to the one you obey. Whether you are slaves to sin, which leads to death, or to obedience, which leads to to righteousness. Okay, so how many of you are getting this today? I hope so. Before you gave your life to Jesus Christ, you were a slave to sin. Satan had his chains around you. He was dragging you around, abusing you, causing you to do things. And Jesus comes along and he takes you out of that kingdom, the kingdom of darkness and slavery, and puts you in the kingdom of a uh, heavenly kingdom. And so now you are free. You now have been declared free. You have the power to choose to live in holiness and in righteousness before God. But many people don't do that. Why? It's because they need someone to show them how to be free, how to live free. And the thing that God wants for you to do most of all is to identify with Jesus Christ. We are to be united with him. Why? I'll tell you why. Jesus is the only man that ever lived who ever lived completely free from the, the terror and the reign of sin. All right? And so let's put this back into the context of slavery just for a moment. Suppose that we had taken a slave right after the Civil War. And uh, suppose we had enough people. We did this with every slave, every male or female, boy and girl. And we would have put them right along someone with a good heart who cared for them. And would, they would have been able to show those slaves how to be free. And they would have taught them, you're now to be educated. You can educate yourself. You can open up a bank account. You can purchase property. You can organize unions that, you know, to get your proper pay. You can walk down the center of the road. You know, you're free to, I know this wasn't in slavery, but you're free to sit on the bus. You get at the front of the bus, you know. Uh, you're, you're, you're the same as anybody who ever walked on the earth ever. How many of you think that in a very, very short time that, that one person or even that whole culture, if we'd have had enough people that they could have walked alongside them, showing them how to be free, that they they would have been lived and acted free. History would read differently, right? And that's exactly, hear me, that's exactly what God wants you to do in your spiritual life. He wants for you to understand that theologically, you have been united with Christ. Spiritually, you're united with Jesus Christ, with his death, burial, and resurrection. All right. The first thing that God asks for us to do after we give our lives to Jesus, right? He wants you to get baptized in water. Why? I'll tell you why. Because when we're baptized in water, if we understand it properly, we understand that we are united with Christ and we're identifying with him, that we get our identity from him. You're united with him in those waters of baptism. And Romans chapter 6, 
verses 4 to 6, the writer to the Romans shows us that we are spiritually united with Jesus. And so let me read this to you tonight. It says this, We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that, notice what it says, buried with him, with him, through baptism into death, in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. Now notice what it says. It talks about the unity, our unity with him if we have been united with him like this in his death. We will also be certainly be united with him in his resurrection. For we know that our old self was crucified with him so the body of sin might be done away with that we should no longer be slaves to sin it's from our unity with christ and our identifying with him as as his identity becomes our identity that we become free from sin and uh you have to accept that freedom as you recognize your unity with jesus Baptism in water is a powerful, symbolic identification of our unity with Jesus Christ. And the more you literally immerse yourself in the person of Jesus, the more and walk with him, the more Jesus can show you how to live out this freedom that God has declared over us. In fact, God, uh, God wants you to unite and identify yourself with him to a strong degree even more so not only are you just free but the bible uses the strongest language possible it tells us you are dead to sin in the strongest language possible even going from the metaphor right of, of freedom and bondage and slavery and freedom uh, there's a stronger me metaphor. The Holy Spirit who inspired uh, the scripture and the author of scripture uses the strongest metaphor available of death and life. And he, this is what he says, by faith we are dead to sin and alive to God. Let me read it for you, Romans 6, 11 in the New International Version. In the same way we are to Count ourselves, it says, count yourselves dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. And uh, you might be thinking, I, I don't get how this works. When you count yourself, and that's what you're saying, is you're saying, this is who I am. I am dead to sin and alive to God. And uh, you're, that's your new identity. You might be thinking, well, you know, man, Pastor Bob, dude, I still struggle. Sure, just like a former slave struggled to understand the new freedom and their new identity, you're going to struggle as well. But here's the key. The more you unite with Christ, the more you're going to accept your new identity. So I hope you're getting this today. Uh, count yourself dead to sin. The old King James version of this verse, Romans 6, 11 says, reckon yourselves dead. That means you think about it in your mind you accept it you start counting on it you understand it you believe it you've reasoned in your mind that you are now dead to sin and alive to god let me tell you what satan's going to do okay satan your adversary is going to do everything to convince you that that is not who you are in fact he's going to tell you the exact opposite right He'll tell you, you aren't free. You'll never be free. You can never be free from this thing. You can't overcome. And so it really kind of comes down to this. Whose report are you going to believe? Are you going to believe what God says about you in his word? That once you've accepted Jesus Christ, that you have a new identity, that you're united with Christ, that you're dead to sin and alive to God? Or are you going to believe the enemy who wants to keep his chains of bondage and wickedness upon you and controlling you? Let me tell you, the Bible tells us this, as a man thinks in his heart, so is he, All right? As you think in your heart, that's how you are. And that's why 
you know, these parents who kind of speak curses over their kids, right? If they tell them, you know, yeah, you're nothing but a loser. You're, you're not going to amount to anything. If they tell them that enough, they'll think it in their heart. It will, it will actually become a self-fulfilling prophecy in their life. But if you tell your children, look, I believe you're going to be a success. People like you. You're going to win. You're going to, uh, you know, be able to make it in this life. They're going to accept that as their identity and their image. What you believe about yourself is incredibly incredibly important and God wants for us to accept this new identity that we are united with Christ. He is our identity. Who Jesus was becomes our identity. And the main point of all of this is that God wants us to be free from the slavery of sin and the bondages of the enemy. And it starts with our identity. And I think every one of us as his children, uh, as we leave this Bible study here in a few moments, we ought to go with our head a little higher, right? With more confidence in our soul that we are a new, we are who he says we are, right? We are a new creation. We're the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. We're free from sin. We're dead to it. We are alive to God. And so the first strategy is to accept your new identity in Jesus, all right, by understanding about being united with him. And then the second strategy that we have to be aware of uh, and understand is we have to be aware of sinful patterns in our life. As you start down this battle towards holiness, you're going to become aware of just how deceitful your own flesh can be. The truth is that we provide, now follow me, we provide the flesh what it needs so that it can satisfy itself. We tell ourselves that we're trying to do what is right and then we continue on in the same old simple patterns that we've always lived in. We tell ourselves, well, man, I have this weakness, it's this besetting sin, this pattern in my life, this addiction, this, I, I just can't get out of it. And the reason why we can't break free of it, can't get out of it, is because we are allowing ourselves to provide everything that the flesh wants to be able to stay in it. And that's why the writer of Romans says this, Romans 13, 14, put on the Lord Jesus Christ. Once again, that's all about your identity, right? Accepting who you are. And then it goes on to say, make no provision for the flesh. Don't make any provision for the sinful nature, for that part of you that has this propensity to want to go do things that you you know you don't really want to do in your spirit, man. But you know, it says, don't make any provision for that. The flesh wants to sin. And what we do so many times is we put our flesh right smack in the place where sin is going to allure us right instead of avoiding us and instead of invo avoiding it. Now, if you are an alcoholic, right? I want to tell you that it is foolish if you believe that you can associate continually with people who are drinking, offering you drinks, going into bars and clubs. It's foolish to think that you can, you know, tour a liquor store, you know, have one beer that it won't hurt you. Any recovered alcoholic would tell you that they had to change the very patterns of their life, where they went, who they associated with, what they did, the way they thought in order to stay free from that. Here's why. The flesh wants what it wants. And here's the concept. We don't provide the flesh what it wants. Okay, if a, a, a man, and by the way, a woman or a woman it struggles with pornography and you know there's this certain gas station you know that uh you know still has you know magazines in plain view where you can see it or movies or dvds you know and it's a temptation listen here's the key don't provide for the flesh by going there buy your gas somewhere else you know if your struggle is online get accountability software uh, you know, uh, and by the way, it's not so. So what we're doing is we're not providing what the flesh wants. OK. And uh, by the way, it is not just for kind of like the more vulgar sins, you know, that that we provide for the flesh. 
The flesh also provides uh, for sins like bitterness and unforgiveness. And, uh, you know, God says we're supposed to forgive others, right? Yet, what do we do? Our flesh will seek out people who uh, will uh, agree with us. We'll talk about our situation with our friends, and they'll respond to us, and they'll say, oh, you are so right. You know, you should be angry. You, should, you know, you should be bitter. And they'll, uh, they'll feed our unforgiveness right back to us instead of talking to somebody who's spiritual and say, you know, I know you've been hurt. What they did wasn't right. It was wrong. But listen, you've got to forgive and let go and move on so that you can have real freedom you see the flesh wants what it wants and so uh you cannot provide for the flesh and, and i want us to understand as we're looking at this uh that 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 temptation and sin follow most generally a very predictable predictable path and pattern in, in our in our lives and we've got to understand if we're going to overcome sin if we're going to defeat the flesh that wants what it wants and it wants sin uh, then we've got to understand the sinful patterns of our lives let me give you an example today all right if watching the news makes you depressed and when you get depressed you call somebody up and they also uh, talk depressingly and that makes you worse depressed and then when you really start feeling bad you start acting out and when you act out you sin that's kind of a little pattern I've just created what you've got to do is go all the way back learn and understand that about yourself become self-aware and go back to say you know something I really don't need to be watching the news you know I'm going to find something more spiritually enlightening more healthy for me to watch and one of the greatest ways by the way to understand and discover these patterns is to journal right to literally write down the events of your life and you'll begin to see the steps and the patterns that are very predictable and you'll begin to understand this is how I get led into sin. This is how my flesh makes provision for me. And when you understand that, then you can begin to go back and say, okay, if I change this here, the end result is going to be different. Now, I'm not saying that sometimes believers don't stumble into sin. Sure, we can be walking down the road and all of a sudden there's a temptation and we yield to it and we fail. And, uh, you know, that's that's not a good thing. But most Generally, there's a specific pattern of things that lead us into that. In fact, did you know that sin actually begins with a thought? Sinful things and acts begin with the thought in our mind. Uh, Romans 13 and verse 14, the NIV tells us this. Clothe yourselves with the Lord Jesus Christ. Oh, wow, there's that uh, identity thing going on again, right? There's that accepting who we are in Christ again. There's our unification with Jesus. Clothe yourself with the Lord Jesus Christ. And then there's this counsel. Do not think about how to gratify the desires of the sinful nature. In other words, don't think about how to gratify the desires of the flesh. In other words, it's that thought. When that thought comes in, we check it at the door and say, thought, you are not welcome here. The little truth, a little poem, I guess I've learned a long time ago. It says, sow a thought, reap an act. Sow an act, reap a habit. Sow a habit, reap a character. Sow a character, reap reap an eternity. Wow, there's a lot to that little poem. So let me say that you could stop sin at the thought with the help of the Holy Spirit. And the more you do that, the more you push that out of your mind. Let me tell you, the Holy Spirit will become like a mighty guard on your mind. You put that helmet of salvation on. You, part of your armor is to guard your mind. Amen. And so uh, that is another strategy. Don't make provision for the flesh. And then the, here's a third strategy. Put your flesh to work for God, all right? Put yourself to work for God. I'm going to talk about King David, right? Everybody knows his story. Yeah, he was a great guy, fought Goliath, had a lot of victories, but he also had a huge failure 
when he sinned with Bathsheba. You remember the story. Everybody else was out working for God, fighting God's battles, except for David. He decided, I'm going to stay at home. And uh, while he was at home, instead of working for God, he's at home chilling, relaxing, whatever. He sees Bathsheba. She's beautiful. He calls for her, commits adultery, you know, winds up having to cover that up by killing your, her husband, Uriah, the Hittite. He thinks that's all great. I've swept it underneath the rug. But uh, all of that happened because he stopped putting his flesh to work for God. He was at home. Now, I'm not saying uh, today that there's not any front any temptation on the front lines of the battle you know that that's not true either you cannot escape temptation temptations are going to happen and god's goal for us is not i want to use a big word today asceticism which is you know we're not supposed to live our lives like we're in a, a monk in a monastery and you know not even be a part of the world and push the world now, we're supposed to live in the world function in the world and be a part of it but but one of the strategies for success in defeating the battle on the inside is to put your flesh to work. Romans 6.13. Let me read it for you tonight. It says, Do not offer the parts of your body to sin as instruments of wickedness, but rather offer yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life, and notice what it says, offer the parts of your body to him as instruments of righteousness. Okay, here's God's strategy. God's strategy is not to tell you, stop sinning and do nothing, right? God knows a bored mind is the devil's workshop. God's strategy is that we take the same members of our body, the same, uh, you know, parts of our body that have been doing simple things, and we put them to work for God. Let me tell you what, it's really hard to sin when you're studying and you're preparing for a Sunday school lesson. It's hard to sin when you're out witnessing to your neighbor, right? It's hard to sin if you're at church. It's hard to sin when you're volunteering to help the neighbor with your kids and doing good works. It's hard to sin when you're uh, developing yourself and doing good, positive things. Uh, when you're engaged in ministry, when you're being a parent to your kids or a spouse to your husband and your wife. It's, I hope you get what I'm saying. When we, if our hands and our feet and our mind and our flesh is so busy doing things for God that are good and wholesome and active, we don't have any energy left or any time left to take those things and use those members of our body for sinful things. And that's what uh, Paul said here in Romans chapter 6, uh, verses 19 through 22. He said this, Just as you used to offer the parts of your body in slavery to impurity and to ever-increasing wickedness. So now offer them in slavery to righteousness, leading to holiness. When you were slaves to sin, you were free from control of righteousness. What benefit did you reap at that time from the things that you are now ashamed of? Those things result in death. Notice what he says. But now that you have been set free from sin and have become slaves to God, the benefit you reap leads to holiness and the result is eternal life. And so basically, if you boil all that big old teaching down, those long verses, basically it says this, get to work and get busy for God. Right? Put your body to work for Jesus. And, you know, churches all over the world need laborers. The harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. And you might say, well, I'm getting older. I don't need. Listen, I don't care how old you are. You can still work for the Lord. My grandmother on my dad's side taught, taught a Sunday school class for 38 years, the ladies' Bible study uh, on Sunday morning. And the day came when she was no longer physically able to teach. But let me tell you, she kept calling some of those ladies for years and years. Why? Because she wanted to pour her life into them. And so if you can pick up a phone and talk, there's a ministry for you. Besides that, if you can't talk to others, you can pray, you can talk to God. So put your body to work serving God. And so count those hours that you spend 
uh, you know, is, is serving others as important. Let me give you a, a, another strategy very quickly. I'm going to try to get through this. You need to live as Jesus lived. You say, well, Pastor Bob, I, I can't live a perfectly holy. Uh, let me tell you something. Here's the key. We need, uh, Jesus lived a perfect life, right? We looked at that actually last week in our teaching. There's a lot to be said about how Jesus lived his life. And the truth is, if we would do what he did, we would have the power that he had, okay? What I'm talking about is to live your life in the practice of spiritual disciplines. Jesus uh, had the habit and the practice of prayer, the habit and the practice of solitude, the practice of fasting, the practice of living in community with others, the practice of worship, the practice, obviously, of scripture memorization, because he would say, have you not read, or it is written, he knew the word, and so that's where strength is found. Now, I want to tell you this. Rules and regulations cannot keep you from sinning. No amount of knowing the rules will stop you from sinning. If that were the case, then in the Old Testament, underneath the law, right, every single man would have been completely free from sin. But I got news for you. The law cannot keep you from sin. Knowing the rules doesn't stop us from sinning. You know, I'm just amazed at how many churches, in a sense, and I've probably been guilty of this as well, you know, uh, try to keep people from sinning by stating the law. But here's the truth. The law can't stop you from sinning. The law only shows you your error. Of course, the writer to the book of Romans, he knew this. Romans chapter 7, uh, this is what he Paul, what Paul wrote. He said, i found that the very commandment, he's talking about the law, the very commandment that was intended to bring life actually brought death. For sin, seizing the opportunity afforded by the commandment, deceived me and through the commandment put me to death. So then the law is holy and the commandment is holy, righteous, and good. What I have come to learn is that the entire Old Testament was written to show mankind that we are sinners in need of a Savior. I'm not saying that the law is bad. Actually, the Bible tells us that the law is good. Knowing what's right and wrong is good because it shows us what sin is. And there are none of us here today who would have ever understood that we were sinners without the law. But let me tell you, the law cannot free you. Even knowing right from wrong can't free you. Well, what does free you? I think from the word, God's word and my personal experience, this is the verse that is so powerful. It says this, Romans 8 and verse number 2 of the New King James Version says this, For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus, the spirit of life in Christ Jesus, the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. Only our closeness and our relationship with Jesus Christ is going to stop us from sinning. It's only because we have that close relationship with him. And the way we get that close relationship with him, the way we activate the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus is to do those traditional spiritual disciplines of prayer, fasting, worship, Bible reading, Bible study, living in community with others, solitude, silence. Uh, if you want a whole book on that, you can read Richard Foster's book, The Celebration of Discipline. It has a whole bunch of uh, spiritual disciplines that people can do. Even journaling is a spiritual discipline. But as we do those spiritual disciplines in our lives, what happens is that the life of Jesus begins to get manifested in us. And that's what rises up and makes us free, all right? That's what allows us to live lives that are above the bondage of the enemy. And that's what God wants. And that's what I want for you 
as a listener to this teaching tonight. I, I pray uh, that that this has been a good teaching, but I've learned in my life that if I am away from him, if I'm beginning to stray a little bit, if I, if I have not been with him, then what I discover is that the power of sin has a greater allure to me. But if I'm practicing those spiritual disciplines, listen, it becomes so much easier to make the right choice, right? Because when you decide to worship, when you decide to pray, when you decide to believe, that's when the Lord comes and strengthens our spirit and our inner man. And the spirit of life in Christ Jesus will make you free from the law of sin and death. That's activated, my friend, by the practice of spiritual disciplines. Let me pray for you. Heavenly Father, I thank you for this Bible study tonight. I pray that you would use it and bless every person who's listened. And God, if there are those who are listening tonight who are struggling, God, with their flesh, Lord, allow these strategies to be activated in their life that they might have complete freedom. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. Thanks for listening. I want to encourage you to join with us on Facebook Live every Sunday morning at 10 30 a.m. We'll be back preaching the word of God. Join us uh, uh, for worship and for praise and for the teaching of the word. God bless you. Thank you for joining.